I'm Sandra Steingraber. I'm a PhD biologist who studies environmental health, and I serve as a senior scientist with the Science and Environmental Health Network, where um, carbon capture and storage is part of my portfolio. Uh, oil and gas extraction has been the focus of my research for the past 10 years. Uh, and as such, I'm the co-principal of the um, Fracking Science Compendium, which will be released in a few weeks in the eighth edition. So I'm delighted to be part of this briefing and share what I know with you. Um, and this gathering is especially meaningful to me because although my PhD is from the University of Michigan, I actually conducted my dissertation research at the Lake Itasca Biological Station up in the Mississippi headwaters. And I feel quite passionate about the task of pre protecting the air, water and forests of Minnesota and the public health of the people who live here. And as your final speaker, I'm not going to present any more PowerPoint slides as I'd like to transition us into an interactive conversation. So I'll be describing some data rather than showing you charts and graphs. And I'm not gonna start off um, with pipelines or ethanol distilleries, um, but actually inside our bodies and then we'll work our way out. So uh, I invite you all to take a breath and then exhale. And with that inhalation, you just swept into the alveoli of your lungs, a pint of the Earth's atmosphere, um, which is two measuring cups full of air, 20% of which is oxygen that's now headed to all of your cells, um, specifically to the mitochondria inside those cells, where through the miracle of the Krebs cycle, to remind you of an eighth grade biology class you had long ago, energy is being extracted from the food you ate in a process called metabolism. And all that oxygen, of course, uh, comes from the world's plants, where through the miracle of photosynthesis, food is created and oxygen is produced as a waste product. More specifically, about half the oxygen in the air we breathe comes from trees on land and the other half from plankton in the ocean. So if you take one breath, you can thank the trees for that uh, gulp of oxygen. And then the next breath is um, thanks to uh, the plankton uh, who are drifting around on the surface of the sea. So in turn, then we of course breathe out carbon dioxide as a waste product of our metabolism. And that CO2 is taken out by the plants in a kind of active communion that allows them to keep on photosynthesizing and keep giving us oxygen. So I wanna point out first that we have chemoreceptors in our carotid arteries that run up our neck and also in, in the medulla oblongata, which is the brain stem in the back of our heads. And, and those chemoreceptors are constantly monitoring our body's levels of both oxygen and carbon dioxide. And, they're, and we're monitoring that, those levels very tightly, both in our bloodstream and in our spinal fluid. And we actually have two separate systems to do this, one for CO2 and the other for oxygen, and they operate independently of each other. And that's because it's not enough for us to get sufficient oxygen. We also have to expel carbon dioxide because whenever carbon dioxide is dissolved in water, and we're, all of us are 65% water by weight, um, that CO2 will turn into carbonic acid and that increases the acidity of the fluid around and inside of all of our cells. So increasing acidity caused by CO2 buildup in our bloodstream, that's called acidosis. And it's the reason actually that we sometimes just sigh deeply in the middle of our afternoon. Um, sighing is actually triggered by um, rising levels of CO2 and low, lowered pH, which is what happens when things become acidified, right? And so as acidosis starts, our first body's response is to sigh deeply. And that, um, because CO2 buildup in our bodies um, starts to trigger acidosis and that's a powerful stimulant to breathe. So I'm going on about this because I wanna put a fine point on the idea that although carbon dioxide is yes, a natural molecule that we all are making uh, just by living, it's also a powerful human toxicant and a cellular poison. The reason we breathe faster when we're exercising is not only to get more oxygen inside our metabolizing cells, but to expel all the building up of CO2 so it doesn't basically just dissolve us. And consequently, and rightly so, Carbon dioxide, um, as has been pointed out by uh, Dan and others today, is on the hazardous uh, right to know substance list as recognized by a host of federal agencies. You heard about the Occupational Health and Safety Administration, but also the Department of Transportation and the National Institute for Occupational Health and Safety. 
safety and health. And these agencies recognize that CO2 is a hazardous substance, not only because it's inherently toxic by this mechanism of acidosis that I've just described to you, but also because pure CO2 is one and a half times heavier than ambient air. And if it's released into the air, it will settle near the ground and displace oxygen. You've heard that uh, phenomenon already today too. So, and that, that makes it different, for example, than other hazardous air pollutants, um, let's say like gasoline vapors, which will rise and, and dissipate in, in open air. So that means that CO2 acts as an asphyxiant and can create respiratory arrest, unconsciousness and suffocation within a minute of exposure. Because not only is it uh, serving as an acid inside of our bodies, um, but also because it's going to stay on the ground, it pushes the oxygen out. So it, did, it exposes us to high levels of CO2, but it doesn't allow us to get oxygen in. So in, by both mechanisms, it harms us. And furthermore, in the, in the seconds before asphyxiation sets in, CO2 acts as an intoxicant, as, as Dan has so um, eloquently described, it creates lethargy, confusion, and disorientation. And this phenomenon of CO2 intoxication really matters when considering the risk of fatalities because it prevents those who are exposed to CO2 from recognizing that they're in danger and fleeing the area. In the words of a two, 2017 review of the medical literature on carbon dioxide poisoning, fatality rates are so high from CO2 exposure in part because, and I'm quoting now, victims of accidental carbon dioxide intoxication often do not act to resolve the situation. They just can't escape. So if quick rescue is achieved, and carbon dioxide toxicity from severely high exposures don't kill victims outright. Um, we don't know much about what happens after that. And, and again, Dan put a great um, point to this. Um, it's known that those who survive have problems that are more than transient, including harm to the brain that extends to personality changes and loss of vision. But the data on this are very slim. And whether this damage is caused through the phenomenon of acidosis or by some other mechanism, we don't actually know. So I spent quite a lot of time this week in preparation for this presentation, reading fact sheets and guidelines from various federal and state agencies for how to rescue and administer first aid to victims of CO2 poisoning. And from that research are a couple of things I wanna point out. First of all, on a lot of these fact sheets, um, they list you know CO2, which is the chemical name, carbon dioxide. And then the synonym next to that is dry ice which of course is what we call the solid form of carbon dioxide. But that detail listing dry ice on these fact sheets <clears throat> um, as a synonym for CO2 re reflects a bigger truth. Um, namely, what we know about the deaths from carbon dioxide poisoning and how um, people exposed to high levels of CO2 um, are harmed, they, they mostly come from occupational studies with workers confined to indoor spaces exposed as uh, to dry ice, um, or in some cases, as Dan mentioned, um, car carbonated beverages as in a, 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 in a bar or a restaurant, or in some cases, even fermentation processes um, like silos or um, winemaking, or CO2 as a byproduct. So first responders are therefore encouraged in these all of these um, fact sheets and guidelines from various state and federal agencies that I looked at. First responders are encouraged to remove victims from the area as quickly as possible because of it, you know, CO2 is like putting chloroform over your nose. It, the, the time between when you feel disoriented and unable to um, act to remedy the situation and when you completely collapse is very slight, like sometimes as short as a minute. So first responders are encouraged to get people out of the area as quickly as possible and, and at the same time take care that they themselves are not overcome in the rescue process. And in the words of one of these fact sheets for first responders, it says, quote, take precautions to ensure your own safety before attempting rescue. So here's where we need to point out that all of this advice assumes that the people who have collapsed are few in number and they're in a small confined space somewhere, um, almost certainly a workspace, and they just need to be dragged out of there. And so the, these guidelines are completely irrelevant and difficult to um, 
to kind of uh, repurpose in the situation of a carbon dioxide pipeline rupture in an entire community, which raises the risk that the internal combustion engine of your ambulance is going to sputter and stall because the same high levels of dioxin that are blanketing the, the whole area and pushing out all the oxygen, right? They're down at the ground level. Um, that oxygen is also needed by spark plugs to make vehicles be able to conduct evacuations. And, and we don't, there's just no guidelines for first responders about this that I could find. The public health literature on carbon dioxide poisoning also mentions another source of possible poisoning. And again, this is um, what you just heard a little bit about from Dan, and, and it goes by the name massive geothermal emission events. And basically the only one we have good records on is this one that took place in Cameroon in 1986 when 1700 people died along with every living thing in a 15 mile radius after a massive release of carbon dioxide gas came out of a lake. It's a volcanic crater lake called Lake Nyos. So that's the kind of one case study that we have. Um, to my knowledge, public health guideline protocols um, don't take those kind of scenarios into a, a account and are intended for small confined workplaces. I could not find any vetted guidelines or best practices for emergency room personnel or first responders for how to handle these so-called massive geothermal emission events from human caused things like a breached CO2 pipeline. The story that we have out of Yazoo County, um, Mississippi is essentially it. Um, and, and, and those folks are kind of the canaries in the coal mine for this massive expansion of um, CO2 pipelines that's now been proposed. Um, and I want to underscore an earlier point by Nikki as well, that um, there's just no comprehensive regulatory framework for looking at community risks to uh, in which a carbon dioxide pipeline is, is traversing that community. And the, the closest analogy that I can come to in all my work with environmental health is what uh, is another Minnesota example actually, when the county of Winona County, Minnesota um, decided to ban silica sand mining for frac sand. And you might remember that story. Um, in fact, it was just um, last, uh, I think last June, May or June of this year of 2021, when the Supreme Court um, refused to hear the case brought by the sand mining company that was attempting to overturn uh, Winona County's ban, which had been upheld by the Minnesota Supreme Court. And the reason I think that this is like kind of the only analogy you have to think how to think about CO2 is that silica sand, like carbon dioxide, is a uh, terrible um, cellular poison and silica uh, lodges deep in the lungs and creates silicosis. But the only data we have about the dangers and exposures of people to silica, silica dust come from workers because only people that work with, uh, you know, jackhammering uh, cement and concrete or glass blowers um, have ever been exposed. We've never, until frac sand mining, exposed entire communities of people, not just um, young, healthy workers who are working an eight-hour day, but pregnant women, um, children, elderly, people with COPD and other disabilities, and so on. And so there, there was no data to, to tell us what a safe level exposure was or how to, how to prevent exposures, how to help people, and so on. And, and the industry tried to argue that absence of data equals absence of, of harm. Um, but that's not what the um, county government in Winona decided. Um, and uh, at any way, they have banned that practice, rightfully so. It's a great example of um, the precautionary principle in action. If, it's, we, if we know that silica is a known cause of, of cancer and silicosis in workers, there's no reason to believe it, it wouldn't have the same effect in a four-year-old. So with that kind of argument, um, Winona County, Minnesota banned the mining of, of silica sand for fracking um, for industrial purposes and that ban has been upheld. So I refer you to that. That was a good decision on the part of um, the elected officials of Winona County.
All right. So the CO2 guidelines that we have, like the silica sand guidelines, presuppose that victims are adult workers. We don't have any data on what happens when a pipeline breaches and fills the air up with toxic levels of CO2. How does it affect pregnant women, children, the elderly, disabled members of the general public? In Minnesota, the fact sheet from your own state health department on carbon dioxide toxicity and safety standards, which I did take a look at, cites the Minnesota Department of Labor Industry for how much carbon dioxide a healthy adult can safely be exposed to over an eight hour work shift. And the Minnesota health Department of Health guidelines make clear that these standards for CO2 exposure, and I'm quoting now, were developed for healthy working adults and may not be appropriate for sensitive populations such as children and the elderly. And then still quoting, MDH is not aware of lower standards developed for the general public that would be protective of sensitive individuals. In other words, we don't know what levels of CO2 are safe for people who are not workers in an industry working an eight hour shift. All right, so I wanna move out of um, the human body now and talk about these CO2 pipelines. Um, do we know that the pipelines carrying the carbon dioxide are safe for the communities they traverse? No, we do not. And there are reasons to think otherwise. And, and one of them comes from the, this explosive um, potential of CO2. And I just wanna put a little finer point on that. You saw the picture um, of the, the, um, the crater that was formed in Mississippi and all of the kind of frozen um, stuff all around it. And I just wanna remind us all why that is, right? So when CO2 is carried in a pipeline, it has to be compressed and put under really high pressure to, to change it from a gas to this kind of sort of pseudo liquid. It's a kind of sort of super critical um, thing that flows. Um, and um, whenever you do a phase change, you change the temperature. The reason we can cool off when we sweat is that um, the sweat is a liquid that comes to the surface of our skin, but to actually have a cooling power, it needs to evaporate, which is why when it's humid, we drip and we don't evaporate and then we don't cool off. But when there's a phase change between liquid water turning into a vapor, that uh, causes things to cool down. That just happens when you change things from a solid to a liquid and from a liquid to a gas. So if a pipeline should breach and liquid CO2 comes spurting out, a couple of things happen. One, um, it all of a sudden expands rapidly in a kind of um, thing that can resemble kind of an explosion um, as it's now not under high pressure. But the other thing is it's gonna move really rapidly from a liquid, the supercritical liquid into a gas and that makes things super cold cold enough as you heard that you could just smash steel with a hammer, but also, and this is another health, health and safety hazard for the people in these communities, anyone close to the pipeline can be, uh, is at risk of frostbite and just, and just becoming frozen. Um, and then secondly um, is uh, to recall that when in the presence of moisture, carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid. And we, as we said in our bodies, that triggers a process called acidosis. In pipelines, of course, it's called corrosion. And to be transported in pipelines, CO2 must be carried as this liquid. And that's a state that carbon dioxide does not typically assume. And again, this liquefaction is created through immense pressure. And if there's any moisture present in the pipeline or in the processing equipment or in the CO2 itself, that um, the CO2 will then acidify, turn into carbonic acid and can eat holes through steel, um, which necessitates these special chrome lined pipes for its transport. So now you've heard the story of the town of Satarsha, Mississippi, where in February, 2020, after days of heavy rain, a CO2 pipeline ruptured and spewed this CO2 cloud throughout the community, sending 40 some people to the hospital and some of whom were found as you saw and heard foaming at the mouth in their stalled cars and they were overcome while trying to escape. So the question is, can pipelines of any kind be engineered so that accidents like that never happen again? with no corrosion, no leaks, no catastrophic failures at any point in its life cycle and at any point in the spider web of thousands of miles of these pipelines. I don't know of any examples where that has ever happened. And I believe for Minnesota, the, um, the story of Enbridge Line 3 is the cautionary tale here. 
All right, so then to, um, to wrap it up, I want to say that Article 1, Section 1 of your own state constitution, the Minnesota State Constitution Bill of Rights, opens by saying, um, government is instituted for the security, benefit, and protection of people in whom all political power is inherent. Um, and I would, um, I'm asking, well, let me back up one more time. I want to, because I want to end with this historical anecdote. Um, Henry Rowe Schoolcraft is officially credited by the state of Minnesota for discovering the headwaters of the Mississippi River that happened in 1832. And that would be Lake Itasca where I did my field work for six years. But he was not the only explorer to make that claim. Other expeditions led by other white men assisted by bands of native people made rival self-serving claims declaring other nearby lakes the true head of the waters and they contested Schoolcraft's claim. And during that time, fraud, plagiarism and social unrest was growing because there was form and fate for, fame and fortune to be made by seizing the prize of naming the headwaters of the Mississippi River after oneself. But the simmering conflict was not in the public interest. The Minnesota state legislature stepped in. Um, it had enough um, and it passed a resolution valorizing the claim of Lake Itasca as the source of the Mississippi. And I'm quoting now from what the state legislature said in 1832, quote, so that the, its earliest explorers not be robbed of their just laurels and to remove temptations to adventurers in, in the future to gain notoriety by attaching their name to said lakes. And by that mechanism, school cross challengers were dethroned by the state government, peace reigned, and Lake Itasca is still called Mississippi's headwaters. So I'm asking you to do something similar. In 1832, the Minnesota state government did not have absolute hydrological proof for which of several lakes was the true source of the Mississippi River, but they did need to settle a socially destabilizing and dangerously escalating conflict among competing profiteers. They needed to govern in a precautionary way, and you can do that too. So to close with the words of your own state constitution, governments is instituted for the security benefit and protection of the people. Your job is to ensure that the security benefit and protection of the people of New York means, of the people of Minnesota means that the, the, that responsibility says you must deny um, this dangerous risk field pipeline project, which operates basically as a hazardous waste sewer for the fossil fuel industry. And, um, and the direct benefit does not go to people, but to the fossil fuel industry and uh, preventing all that from going forward, I think um, is now in your hands. Thanks.